So then we had this guy, so that's Spencer's spin stabilization. Then we had this guy, Goddard, the father of modern rocketry, who was an American, and also considered to be nuts. In fact, I'll cite some, some, uh, some factual information that will even support that claim. Now, I'm saying he was not nuts, but he was just considered, all these people were considered to be kind of out there. So Goddard's claim to fame is, well, he, he built the first liquid. Liquid rocket motor and flew it. I think it flew, you know, not very high, 50 feet or something like that, in, 19, in the 1920s or 30s. And uh, he did a lot of other research, too, into, into principles, and he had all these patents. Now, the interesting thing was Goddard was an American, did all this work. Who were the people, you know, the people who invent the technology and get the, and file the patents are not always the one who brings the technology to the masses. Who actually took that technology and brought it to the masses? It was the Germans. It was von Braun who had taken all of Goddard's work and then built this rocket called the V-2. And the Germans used this V-2 as a, it was a missile. It went pretty far. They would launch it from Germany and it would land in London or in Antwerp, which is, is in Belgium. They fired over th almost 2,000 of these V-2 vehicles. Uh, somewhere I have some video of one blowing up on the pad. If I can find that, I'll, I'll do a little insert here in this, in this tutorial. But the V-2 was a liquid, liquid rocket, which was in mass production. Now, they did use concentration camp labor. They were not exactly nice employers. Um, so we should note that, you know, note that. But they did have a, a major project going there. Von Braun, at the end of the war, then, uh, you know, when the handwriting was on the wall, Von Braun Braun and this other guy, Dorn, Dornberger, who was a major general in the uh, Air, German Air Force, uh, and, and a bunch of their, like a hundred of their workers, all, they essentially all went in search of the Americans, right? If the war is over, two people are, are going to take over and start occupying the United States or the Soviet Union. Who do you want to go, you know, live with? And so they all started heading for the Americans, and we were searching them out, and then we brought them to the U.S. So now the, the Civil Air Patrol, as far as I can tell, the test does not go into the more modern history, but I actually find the more modern history to be more ex interesting because we actually had a competition going on. So let me, let me clean up my board, and I'll say a few more words about modern history. So Von Braun came to the United States. He, I think he went first to some place in Texas, and then they put him in Huntsville, Alabama. Uh, at the home of the Redstone Arsenal. And I was going to put USA, but in that case, the A stands for Army. The Army, U.S. Redstone Ars U.S. Army Redstone Arsenal. Uh, the other guy, uh, Dornberger, insert inserted himself into uh, some giant aerospace company, and I think became a vice president. Uh, I think it was with Bell. Uh, if I'm not, you know, I might be mistaken on that. Bell Aircraft. Um, so they put that whole team together there. Um, there were also other teams, right? So we had this guy, Van Allen, was working on some stuff um, as a researcher. The, he was the one who did the Van, you know, identified the Van Allen belt of uh, asteroids. Uh, and then there was also um, other groups that were working on things. The Air Force was doing studies. Uh, the Navy was, you know, was figuring out how they could decide to make space one of their missions. You know, so it's interesting how we not only had, we had competition of the, you know, United States versus Russia versus the Soviet Union, and there was also competition, Army versus Navy versus the Air Force. You know, it's interesting how in the government there's a, it's like a competition, you know, it's like a free market of, well, of sorts. Except you don't get to distribute profits to shareholders. But there was competition within the U.S. US uh, military, and also we were competing against the Russians. Um, so we had the Army working at Redstone Arsenal. They developed this rocket that, um, 
What the heck was the name of that rocket that they built? Um, let me see if I have it written in my notes here. Oh, the uh, I think it was called the Mercury Redstone. And Ben Allen, I think, was loosely aligned with them. Then there was the U.S. Navy. The U.S. Naval Research Lab. And the NRL, the Naval Research Lab, was given the job of making a rocket also, and they built one called Vanguard. Now, now notice, it's an interesting question. Now, this was all done during the regime of President Eisenhower. And Eisenhower's biggest fear was that we did not know what the Russians were doing with regard to nuclear weapons. You know, we didn't know how many they had. We didn't know where they were. We didn't know what their intentions were, whether they were ready to strike first. And so, and, and the, you know, the CIA had completely failed to provide any human intelligence whatsoever. So, you know, that's what led to the development of the U-2 spy plane. That, we, that way we could fly over and we could see what was going on. Um, but Eisenhower had some other issues, right? Overflying another country, you know, t typically is considered an act of war. That's why we always wanted to have deniability, and we only wanted to fly higher than their surface air missiles could reach. Not totally successful, because we had one of our guys shot down in 1960, uh, 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 Gary Powers, uh, at the worst possible time. So we had this thing, the, the, uh, there was this thing called the International Geophysical Year, I think it was like 1957 or 56, and um, it was it was a uh, a, a worldwide uh, you know effort to do science related to the uh, atmosphere and you know beyond the atmosphere research, all with you know purely civilian intentions. So what Eisenhower said was let's let's launch something only as a purely, you know, altruistic experiment, scientific experiment. And then that will give us then, because once the satellite's in orbit, it's going to fly over every part of the Earth. That's just a fact of life of orbital mechanics, and I'll discuss why that is, you know, later on. But once it's in orbit and flying, then we'll have precedent that things can fly in orbit, it's not an act of war, and then we can go pursue our real intentions, which are to put up spy satellites so we can see what the Soviet Union is doing. Now, because he was super concerned about this whole civilian, non-military um, pretext, they said, let's have the Naval Research Lab, which even though the word naval is in it, it's really not a military organization per se. And they had their work on this Vanguard rocket. Now, the guys down at Redstone Arsenal continued to build bigger rockets and launch them. And so, lo and behold, in like 1956, they launched a rocket that had enough thrust, that had enough power, enough thrust to actually put something into orbit. And they were told, do not put anything into orbit because we have all these other considerations from a political standpoint. So they gave it the project of Vanguard. The Vanguard effort, what happened then was it was, they took what, something that was in a development phase, you know, and developing spacecraft and rockets is not, you know, a slam dunk. You have to be prepared to have a lot of things go wrong in, in the process of learning how to do it correctly. So, so they took something that was essentially still in the R&D stage and they said, okay, let's ramp up the effort, speed it up, and try to get something into orbit. And lo and behold, the first Vanguard that they tried to launch for that purpose, they had some successful launches, but then the first one they launched with an actual satellite payload blew up on the pad. And then right after that, the Russians launched um, uh, Sputnik. which was a little satellite that just, all it did was beep. But it went over the whole Earth and it was, you know, you could, apparently you could hear it beep if you tuned into the right radio frequencies, it flew over and this thing just went beep, beep, beep. Um, in 1957. So they are credited for being the first to put anything into orbit. Now all, all the, just for the sake of uh, completeness, this is, a, this is in like Baltimore area. 
This is all in a place called Baco Noir, Baco Noir, which is somewhere in the Soviet Union. It's not in Russia. So all the initial activity was in this place called Baco Noir, which is uh, it's in Kazakhstan. So if you've seen the movie Borat, then you know all about Kazakhstan. So that's where Baco Noir is. I'm probably not pronouncing that even close to correctly. That's where all their initial activity was done. And you've got to believe that as time went on, there were a lot of U.S. ICBMs pointed at Baco Noir, and there were a lot of spy satellites taking a lot of pictures as time went on. They eventually also had another facility in Placets. And, uh, and then they went called Star City. So anyway, we'll talk more about some of this Cold War stuff you know, later. Maybe it's not that exciting after all. But there was this international geophysical year. So the Eisenhower's biggest concern was getting being first into orbit and having this become an act of war. And sure enough, Nikita Khrushchev gave him a get out of jail card, free card for that whole thing because they, they put the precedent in place, free game. Now, then we started to ramp up and do our own, our own uh, program. So then, since the Vanguard thing blew up on the pad, it destroyed the pad. That's not a good thing. Plus, they had some problems where they had to work out. So they went back to the Mercury Redstone rocket. They put a uh, payload on it called uh, Discover. I think it was a Discoverer. It was uh, Explorer. Explorer One. I think that was in either late '57 or early '58. On top of a Redstone rocket, and we launched our first satellite, Explorer One, into orbit. It also had no purpose other than it made of it. I don't know if it had any instrumentation. It just, you know, made some sound, I believe. So. And then, then we both, you know, both countries and other countries, China, Israel, France, the United Kingdom, all started ramping up space programs of, of various phases, you know, uh, uh, magnitudes. Uh, so that's a little bit about history. Let's go on now to, uh, if I haven't already bored you to death, let's go on now to physics of rockets. Oh, there's probably, let me just say two more words about the history. First guy in space. Was this guy, Yuri Gagarin. First American, Alan Shepard. I think I'm spelling that correctly, Alan Shepard. Uh, I think, it, you know, this came a couple of years after the first satellite was launched. In between, both countries actually launched a dog, too. So the dog was the first living thing in this space. Um, neither of these was orbital, right? These were suborbital. These were the same. These were the same as the uh, SpaceX or something, going into the atmosphere and then coming back down.